Attention, this is the first of a planned two videos on the Resident Evil 2 Remake. This video will be exclusively covering gameplay, mechanics and graphical fidelity. I have a hell of a lot to say about this game and trying to confine it to one video has proven difficult. So with that out of the way, let's begin. On the 28th of January, three days after the release of the Resident Evil 2 remake, IGN published this article, a guide to all the codes in Leon and Claire's first scenario. It says, quote, This page contains every combination, code or solution for every safe, dial lock or similar code input device. This was factually wrong for a start, several of the game's codes are completely different in the second scenarios, although this has been amended since the completion of this script and is now actually correct. But more important is this. You can use this page to cheat and get stuff out of sequence. Cheat and get stuff out of sequence, otherwise known as sequence breaking, a very professional sentence indeed. Personal gripes with linguistics aside, I have one major problem with this suggestion. From TV Tropes. Sometimes fans of a game develop ways to complete tasks in an unexpected order or skip them entirely contrary to the developer's intentions. Such acts and the attempts to discover them are known as sequence breaking. Sometimes the player exploits a glitch or a bug, or jumps a fence using an unforeseen combination of abilities and careful timing. A great example of this is the Duke's archive skip in Dark Souls used to avoid the first encounter and mandatory death with Seath the Scaleless, or making a small jump on the staircase in Anor Londo to avoid a good chunk of tedium and get straight to the boss room. There's also this ludicrously long list of glitches and exploits famously demonstrated in AGDQ for Super Mario 64, and exploit-riddled speedruns of Mirror's Edge are quite something to behold. From Giant Bomb, Sequence breaking is the ability to complete sections of a game out of the intended order, or skip them entirely, through skill and knowledge of the game. Why am I talking about this? Because the generally dismissive tone employed by the author of the aforementioned Swiss cheese of an IGN guide implies that making use of these codes will somehow magically get you to places or items you shouldn't have at certain points in the game. As if the Resident Evil franchise has ever greatly cared about the order of events when its own plot is as comprehensible as a Len Kabazinski movie. Basically what I'm saying is this. Knowing the codes for the safes and what have you beforehand, and memorising them for every successive run does not sequence break the game. You don't get anything other than extra ammo or a hip pouch. It would be sequence breaking if you were to use a method to skip the entire first boss, for example, but trotting into the first lot room and opening the safe for an easy hip pouch is hardly sequence breaking. Hell, it's not even an exploit. If anything, it's flat out encouraged by not just Resident Evil 2, but the original non or lesser linear series overall. Memorising codes, sequences, the best routes, the fastest methods is crucial to achieving numerous rewards throughout the series' history, and particularly in the period of 1996 to 2004. Resident Evil is a series that wants you to grab that ammo early, that wants you to remember exactly where the keys are, the exact order in which to unlock doors, the fastest route around the map. It wants you to remember exactly where everything is, and to use your recollection of the game to avoid unnecessarily taxing encounters. You're not cheating the system. Implying that inputting codes early is sequence breaking does such an injustice to this game and its parent series overall that I've quite possibly just spent 10 minutes ranting about it without much point, other than to tick off a box that would only have been brought up later on. And besides, it's cool to hate IGN right now, isn't it? Yeah. Let's just say yes and move on. Remaking a beloved game carries with it an ungodly weight of expectation and desire. Most level-headed individuals understand that a remake will never be a one-for-one -one upscale of its original source material. Liberties will always be taken, mechanics brought forth to the modern age, character models tweaked to look less like Play-Doh and more like actual human beings, and yet there are always purists who disparage any perceived difference. 
no matter how small or insignificant. Consider the decision to update the combat mechanics in next decade or at this point next millennium's Final Fantasy VII remake to more closely mirror those of the recent FF15 rather than the turn-based mechanics of old. Well, there is always the original. In an ideal world, remaking a game would be unnecessary unless extreme circumstance presents the opportunity. Games lost to time or simply impossible to play on modern hardware would be a fine choice, but then the question becomes less how do we update this to the modern day and more how do we capture the spirit of the original whilst bringing the game forward to modern generations. There are timeless games for sure, Tetris, Pong, Pac-Man, games where the only real benefit to a remake would be the refresh rate on a modern television. But the closer you get to the modern day, and particularly console generations from the PS1 or PS2 onwards, the less amicable players seem to be towards remade games. The general school of thought seems to prefer that developers focus on creating new ideas instead of recycling old ones. And I can't say that I especially disagree. Every once in a while though, a core group of fans will strive to bring their one collective wish to life, and thus Resident Evil 2 2019 was born. The desire for a Resident Evil 2 remake had been doing the rounds for a good while before Capcom cottoned onto the fact that their franchise was in hot water. With the high sales but conversely dismal fan reaction to Resident Evil 6, Capcom made the commendable decision to take a step back from their monstrous mess of a franchise with an eye to beginning from scratch. And when the resounding success of their refreshing take on the series in the form of Resi 7 reached their wallets, the company undoubtedly knew that they were treading the right path. Like Resi 7, the decision to update the remake's mechanics with a more modern twist came at the expense of certain staples of the original trilogy of fixed-angle, pre-rendered games. Gone were the fixed cameras and their ubiquitous need to pause to buffer every time the angle switched. Gone were the tank controls, once a core aspect of survival horror, a unique mechanical decision that was necessary to accommodate for said fixed angles. And thankfully, gone was the goofy voice acting and stilted animation. Looking back on the original Resident Evil 2, it may be tough for anyone born into the current generation of gaming to understand what was so seminal about the game. Its character models look like grated cheese, and its gameplay is so damn dated, right? Well, no, not right, not really. You see, what makes Resident Evil 2 special, and what allows it to stand head and shoulders above even games within its own franchise, is its exceptional attention to detail its unrivalled scope when compared to its peers, and its wit, charm, and character. It was the introduction of series staples Leon S. Kennedy, Claire Redfield, and Ada Wong, all three of whom brought with them a dynamic its predecessor could only dream of. And aside from its more intense, vastly more complex and involving story, it also tried something the series has not really bothered with since. Multiple scenarios. Whilst it's true that the original Resident Evil changed depending on whether you chose Jill or Chris, there was no clear canon that could be provably demonstrated within the game. It's canonised that the survivors of the incident were Brad, Barry, Chris, Jill, and Rebecca, but neither scenario actually shows this story. Barry doesn't appear in Chris's campaign at all, and the same is true of Rebecca for Jill's campaign. Resident Evil 2 has four scenarios. Leon A, Leon B, Claire A, and Claire B. Each one varies the sequence of events and outcomes of certain boss fights, character interactions, and so on. There is a clear canon visible with the scenarios, and it is widely agreed that the actual sequence of events is Leon B and Claire A. Sure, there will always be questions, why is this door still locked if Claire's already been through it? How come all of the zombies are still kicking around if Leon's already been here? That's the nature of a video game, Mr. Pedantic. So you may laugh at the silly old game with its dated graphics and its clunky gameplay, but Resident Evil 2 is easily one of the earliest examples of Yahtzee's rules for a perfect sequel, a game that took the decent groundwork of its predecessor and used it as a springboard to perfection. So, how do you remake something that everybody loves? I'm being hyperbolic of course. Resi 2 definitely has detractors somewhere on the internet, although I've never met one personally, but as a game of its time, Resident Evil 2 was outstanding. Like the original, it nailed its atmosphere, its pacing, and its explorative nature. There was something about these games that prompted the urge to check every corner, to fill out the map, to find absolutely everything that the game has to offer. Something that was naturally lost over time, as the games persistently reshaped themselves into their largely linear later iterations. 
The obsessive in me rather enjoyed turning the maps from one colour to another to indicate that all the items in the area had been located and all the puzzles solved. It's just one of those strangely satisfying things. With the way the series has gone these past few years, and as I mentioned in my Resi 7 video, it was with understandable wariness that the community regarded the announcement of the Resi 2 remake. But as more details emerged and Resi 7 proved a success, we saw the first glimpses of a Capcom with long thought dead. And with the Resi 2 remake, the resounding success of Resi 7 was compounded tenfold. Before I dive into this analysis, review, whatever you want to call it, I need to issue an immediate spoiler warning since I'll be discussing endgame content pretty much straight away. I would strongly urge anyone with even a passing interest in this game to go away and play it right now. This video can happily wait for you, and to be honest, Capcom deserve the sales. They need to know that this is what the fans want, not whatever this was. So let's get on with it. I'll be starting with criticisms for two reasons. Firstly, because there really aren't that many, and secondly, because those that do exist are frankly trivialised by the excellence of the rest of the game. I'll begin with a brief list of some minor complaints that need to be mentioned, but don't really factor into the game enough to be discussed to great length. Following that, we'll move on to some core concerns that I have. Unlocking infinite ammo weapons through standard scenario playthroughs somewhat trivialises hardcore mode because there's barely any penalty to using them unless you're really hankering for an S++ rank. But then there's nothing saying that you have to use them anyway. I would have preferred the more traditional inventory screen, as the more streamlined and continuously expanding inventory we have now makes the formally careful inventory management and decision making as to what you should always carry and what you don't need at a moment's notice a little trivial. But I suppose that could be seen as a highly positive change as well, so it's just a matter of swings and roundabouts really. Claire's face looks really weird. Like, really weird. It doesn't look like Claire. We have current gen editions of both Claire and Leon, and whilst Leon looks pretty analogous to his Resi 6 counterpart, Claire doesn't really look anything like her Revelations 2 character model. Maybe it's just me. It's not just me, is it? Yep. You can kite around him all you like, but Mr X is designed to always find you eventually, even if there is no earthly reason why he should be anywhere near the area you're in. Speaking of Mr. X, his hitbox is a little screwy sometimes, but only a tiny bit. This section is really annoying. You can kill all of these zombies and these two little buggers will still pop out of nowhere to block your path. The voice acting is, for the most part, pretty good, but there are a few occasions where it's either a little off or it doesn't feel quite invested. Claire's voice actress takes some time to find her feet, though as the game progresses she definitely gets better whereas Leon maintains a pretty good consistency throughout the game, with one or two exceptions. Ada's voice actress is easily the most impressive, being almost, almost as good as her original. It's a shame that neither Paul or Matt Mercer were brought back for Leon, and absolutely a shame that Sally Cahill, Cahill, I'm not sure, I'm sorry, and Alison Court weren't brought back for Ada and Claire respectively, but this isn't the first time that they've been replaced, and likely won't be the last. It is a tiny, tiny bit immersion breaking that enemies just flat out can't enter certain rooms, which means if you're trapped with enemies right outside the door, you can continuously bob in and out to shoot or stab them. And as long as you don't cross the threshold and keep the door open, they can't actually get you. But you would never exploit such a bizarrely specific mechanic, would you? And that's everything, or at least that's every tiny niggle that I could remember after playing the game for the equivalent of a straight week. I've heard some say the game is glitchy, but I've yet to come across anything even remotely noticeable unless the aforementioned door exploit could technically be considered a glitch. On the PS4 Pro, at least, the game runs incredibly smoothly, and with the HDR mode enabled, it is truly gorgeous. Not that that's going to be reflected in the footage, because for whatever idiotic reason you can't save game captures in Resi 2 if the HDR is on, but if you switch it off you can record it just fine. What an incredibly odd decision, Capcom. On to the major issues. I have two, but they deserve a longer discussion by virtue of being bizarre design decisions more than anything. This is the last spoiler warning that I'll issue, so if you haven't played this game but want to, I strongly recommend stopping here. My first, and um, arguably my only real problem with the game, occurs towards the finale of Leon's campaigns. In both Leon A and Leon B, you fight the Stage 3 William Birkin mutation with a reasonably decent amount of supplies and ammo provided in the arena for a fight. However, 
Less than 10 minutes later, you must fight the final form of the tyrant, Mr. X, on an incredibly small platform that progressively gets smaller. Although it takes far fewer bullets to take him down compared to Birkin, the tyrant has a particular attack that requires reasonable stopping power to prevent. And if you've used all of your good ammo, you're going to be seeing this screen quite a few times. I dislike it in any game where there are multiple boss fights one after another, particularly when there is either little or no opportunity to restock beforehand. In its defence, the game provides you with at least a small handful of bullets and a few healing items beforehand, but it's not really sufficient considering the tyrant's strength, damage output, and damage resistance, especially if you're playing on hardcore. The boss fight with the tyrant itself is easily the worst part of the game, and whilst I appreciate that that may be an inflammatory suggestion, let me explain. One of the problems with all of the Resident Evil games before the implementation of quick time events has been mobility. Tank controls serve their purpose for this kind of game, but they also highlight their own shortcomings when the player is thrust into difficult situations that require fast reflexes. For the majority of the games that feature tank controls, this isn't really an issue. Not being able to dodge an attack is no problem if you can literally just take a few steps back out of the enemy's grasp. But when it comes to the tyrant, his hitbox is so wide and the arena so small that not being able to hurriedly rush to one side or even just duck presents massive problems in this fight. Perhaps it's because I'm a terrible strategist, but given that there's nowhere to hide on this arena in comparison to the previous fight with Birkin, it is extremely difficult to avoid damage, and by extension the fight can be very frustrating. This was the only part of the game that genuinely infuriated me. Although relative to the outstanding quality of the rest of the game, it's only the barest blemish. The second, and easily the most negligible issue with the game, is the incredible disparity between the amount of damage that enemies take. As I understand from developer interviews, the enemies work on something of a randomised HP counter, where each zombie has its health calculated beforehand, rather than all of them requiring a set amount of bullets to take down, like previous games. A shotgun blast will generally sweep most enemies off their feet, but it isn't guaranteed to kill them. Pistol shots have a wide variety of responses depending on where you hit, how many there are, and how far away you are. Some enemies will go down extremely quickly, whereas others will just keep on trucking, swallowing your bullets like sweets. Now, this is a great idea in principle, but in execution it makes for some of the most baffling encounters in the game. The question of why some zombies only take one or two bullets to drop with their heads spread like cauliflower, where others can eat entire clips to the face and keep going, has already been answered above. But the question of why this is so disproportionate amongst basic enemies hasn't. This is an issue I can take or leave, as in the long run I suppose it makes a modicum of sense to have enemies require different amounts of firepower to take down, even if you're a pitch-perfect headshot champion. However, it is still incredibly disheartening and demoralising when you get a string of enemies who just won't bloody well die quickly. The game does passively discourage you from just shooting everything, however, and there are other means of incapacitating enemies or just scooting around them. But for the less confident players, trying to balance inventory management with the widespread of enemy HP counters could prove to be a deal-breaker. With the advent of a proprietary game engine, one that Capcom have proven to be not just capable but at times outstanding, comes the inevitable overhaul of not just the obvious graphical fidelity but the layout and complexity of the game itself. Whilst a huge majority of the game is essentially analogous to its predecessor, an erstwhile effort has been made to improve the believability and flow of the game and its maps. This is particularly noticeable in the introduction, where your chosen character arrives at a petrol station just outside of Raccoon City. An incredibly concise, to the point and gorgeous area that serves as a simple tutorial to the game's new look, feel and control scheme. Following on from this, the walk to the station is shorter but sets the tone incredibly well, the lashing rain, the flames, walking corpses dogging you every step. You're almost powerless, with your only means of defence being the few bullets you managed to save from the previous area, if any at all. And since the majority of players won't even bother trying to waste ammo on the enemies here, it serves as an excellent introduction. The game's opening 15 minutes is an instant highlight on some of the larger changes made to its look, tone and in particular its plot. Though in general, it tightly follows the original slightly daft but earnest and enjoyable plot, it also spices things up a little 
by giving you a few minutes to get used to the new controls and atmosphere before it actually plunges you into the game proper. Although the argument could be made that the opening areas of the game feel a little rushed in comparison to the original steady and methodical progression through the streets, I would have to disagree. Whilst it is true that the game's overall goal is to get you to the police station as quickly as possible, it by no means tries to limit your capacity to drink in this loving render of a city reborn. We'll discuss the story and particularly the decision to move some of the game's events around at a later time in another video. So for now, let's concentrate on the game's appearance and its level design. Up to and including Code Veronica, one thing the mainline Resident Evil series has always excelled at is level design, and Resident Evil 2 is no different. Like the 1996 original and its remake, the series has always compelled you to memorise the maps rather than spend great deals of time staring at the in-game screens, and rewards you for finding the most elegant, swiftest and most expedient route through each of its areas with the good old EA-branded feeling of pride and satisfaction at having mastered the game. Acclimatising yourself to the game's world makes it far easier to challenge yourself to be faster, to save your ammo, to learn to dodge the trickier enemies and complete the no-item box challenges. But more than that, learning the layout of your game by heart speaks volumes of the careful and methodical way that Capcom pieces these games together. You will always know where you're going, what you need when you get there, and what to do next. It's not always sunshine and roses when you turn a corner and there's a big burly bloke in a top hat stomping towards you, but hell, if it doesn't turn an otherwise unassumingly ordinary corridor into a roller coaster ride of doom. Just... Jesus Christ! The game's aesthetic and gorgeous visuals absolutely help in this regard. Each room, each corridor, every brief glimpse of the city streets down to the blandest of sewer pipes is distinguished by a distinct theme, colour gradient and layout. And yet, despite its incredible fidelity, this isn't necessarily something that has been improved from the original, excluding the actual physical look of the game, of course. The original Resi 2 was fantastically designed and, like the first game, a nemesis uses its pre-rendered backgrounds to its advantage. Although subject to the late 90s blocky feel whilst 3D gaming was still finding its footing, the entire reason Capcom used pre-rendered backgrounds was because it allowed them to dedicate considerably more fidelity to giving each area a unique look and feel. Whilst they do look laughable now, the design ethos means that even on a stupidly large 4K television, they still hold up reasonably well. So when I say that this isn't something that's improved from the original, I don't mean it looks like shit, far from it. I mean that it has absolutely captured the incredibly stylized, unique dynamic of the original. One of the biggest questions that needs to be asked with this game, and one that certainly did the rounds up to the point of release, is how do you make zombies scary? Zombies have quickly become one of the most overused default states in media. The market is absolutely oversaturated with the bloody things. From zombie films to zombie games, post-apocalyptic literature, terrible action movies, sincere and heartfelt dramas, the list is seemingly never-ending. Hell, even the original Red Dead Redemption had a sodding zombie expansion. We're so used to zombies that half the time the thought of another piece of zombie media is just off-putting which is why games like The Last of Us and films like The Girl with All the Gifts are so effective, even if the latter did borrow heavily from the former. They don't deal with the simple outbreak of The Walking Dead. They deal with the human drama, properly. The connection between survivors, and the choices we make. Gifts is a pretty good book and a similarly good film, although I may be slightly biased because part of it was shot not too far from where I live, but the reason it did so well despite ostensibly being a zombie movie was because it dealt with themes that the zombie media tends to ignore, or doesn't do very well. How do you rebuild a broken world? The problem with the oversaturation of walking corpses is that they just aren't scary anymore. And yet, somehow through a combination of exceptional lighting, gorgeous visuals, and fabulously juicy enemy design, Capcom have captured the heart and soul of what made The Walking Dead terrifying to begin with. Sure, they're slow and unsteady, ambling ungainly around until a sudden burst of speed pitches them towards your throat, and sure, making the decision between a swift dodge or just unloading a few rounds in their schools is always a tense one, 
But what makes Resident Evil 2's zombies frightening is the sheer visual gratuity with which they've been designed. Look at this mess, it's delightful. Even the corpses that never once stand up to attack you have a powerfully disgusting goriness to them. Slit throats, gouged guts, split heads, slack jaws. They react as realistically as you can imagine a shambling corpse would. Limbs tremble when you shoot them and repeated attacks to the same area will eventually sever the said limb. Yet the zombies will keep coming for as long as they're still capable of moving, absolutely in keeping with their hideous nature. The game zombies have gone from the most generic of ugly baddies to easily the most horrifying amalgamations of man, death and decay that the franchise has ever seen. When it comes to its other enemies, there's been some slight modifications. The Lickers, although having appeared in other games since the original, with a particularly greasy character model appearing in Resident Evil 5 and 6, have been carefully planned and placed in a select few areas instead of thrown gratuitously about. The end result is that you must always be on your guard, because although you can walk right past them since Lickers are blind, the slightest swift movement will send them hurtling in your direction. And believe me, they hit bloody hard. There is nothing more tense and equally as rewarding than walking most of the way down a corridor, then breaking into a sprint at the last moment and watching the liquor fly harmlessly past your face as you bust into the next room. Skating around them is relatively easy once you get used to them and learn their routes and patterns. Until Mr. X starts cavorting about. More on him later. Otherwise, Resi 2 is, and was, fairly traditional with its enemies, zombies, zombie dogs, lickers. It also featured an enemy that was confined to just one room in the entire game. A giant gooey moth who pretty much just sat there and took punishment until it died. That particular enemy has been removed entirely from the remake and I can't say as I'm either surprised or bothered given the lack of purpose it served other than to briefly bar access to a story item. But there was also one particular enemy that has seen an overhaul in the remake and absolutely for the better. The plants. In the original game, these were literally walking plants with flower buds that opened up to spit poison or acid at you. They wiggled their little tentacles around and tried to give you hugs of death, but being tremendously slow and miserably easy to destroy, they were roughly as threatening as a soggy teddy bear. These horrifying abominations have taken their place. Vegetated humans wreathed in vines and oozing acid. If they grab you and you're out of defensive items, they will give you a permanent facial rearrangement. Rather than just being walking plants, they are now the soulless, corrupted vessels of the facility's scientists. But they don't act and react like their zombified counterparts. These guys will go down if you shoot out the bulbs covering their body, but the only way to down them for good is to douse them in flames, and even then you need to make sure that they are thoroughly fried. Their accompanying orchestral squeal is no joke either. You'll hear it building in the background and mutter, oh Jesus, long before they actually appear on your screen. My recommendation for these enemies is to get rid of them as quickly as you possibly can, whether with grenades, flame rounds, or the flamethrower itself. Because trust me, when it matters most, you will want them out of your way. Oh, and the giant spiders have been completely removed from the game as well, so any of you guys out there with arachnophobia, you can rest easy. With the basic enemies out of the way, we can move on to the bosses, and this was where the game surprised me with one specific encounter. The giant alligator in the sewers. In the original game, this bloody great thing was loitering here, and all you really needed to do was run away from it, wait until it lined up with a handy explosive canister on the wall and blow it to shit. It was easily the most bizarre encounter in the game, and quite frankly, probably one of the most bizarre encounters in the entire series, and that is saying something. I've always felt like the whole alligator in the sewers shenanigan was a reference to something oddly specific, rather than just being a big lizard for the sake of a big lizard. But aside from a throwaway line in E.T., I can't imagine what else it might be referencing. Hell, even Resident Evil 7 uses the overgrown lizard as a punchline with its television show Sewer Gators. A quick Google of sewer alligators tells me this is a common urban legend in New York and similar urban cities in America, but being a Brit, this isn't something I'm familiar with, since most of our native wildlife is furry and cute. Regardless, the encounter with Crocosaurus here genuinely surprised me. I don't know what I was expecting, other than to hope that it would be slightly less dull, but Capcom certainly threw me for a loop when they pulled this hilarious chase sequence out of nowhere. As far as comedy goes, the series has always had a sometimes stifled, oftentimes totally blatant sense of humour. 
And so rather than trying to make something serious out of a big lizard, Capcom took this encounter in very much the opposite direction. The chase sequence is brief, just long enough to be enjoyable and not outstay its welcome. And once it concludes, you're gifted with this gorgeous one-liner. Chew on that, you overgrown son of a bitch. Beautiful. Yes, it's silly, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't love it. As has often been the case with the franchise, the moments of levity in the game serve to instill a degree of calm after the harrowing events of the previous encounters, and I would argue that the Sewer Gator appearance, happening at roughly the halfway mark, is the only real moment of light-heartedness in the entire game. And even then, it only occurs in Leon's campaigns, there's no equivalent in Claire's scenarios. In fact, I would posit that Claire's scenarios are considerably darker than Leon's given the addition of the Chief Irons subplot, but we'll get to that when we talk about the story. The attack of the Killer Croc is a much needed breather from the otherwise relentless onslaught of darkness, despair and desperation. And speaking of relentless, the game's updates to Mr X and William Birkin are little short of fantastic. In both the original Resi 2 and Resi 3, the low fidelity relative to the current standards meant that bosses who were not something particularly specific, say a giant snake or a giant spider, tended to look like a pulsing, writhing mass of nothing in particular. And tell if that grotesque ethos hasn't been carried over with renewed style. Birkin's steady devolution from a relatively man-shaped mass to a pulsating mess, Vaguely humanoid even as he dissolves into a liquefied pool of gunk and spines presents a new and interesting challenge with every encounter, and like the original game, his absolute final form is not fully realised until the B scenarios, and it is thoroughly delightful. Now before you say it, yes, I did give Resident Evil 7 a fair amount of jip for having a big gooey mess as a final boss. Why is this any different? So. The difference is that there is set up and payoff with both Birkin and Mr X. Both begin in a fairly simple, nondescript form, even ordinary you might say, despite the rather obtrusive eye protruding from Birkin's shoulder. But as the game goes on, both of them descend steadily into a state of being far removed from their more composed origins. We witness them devolve into their final forms, they don't just appear out of nowhere as an already giant gooey mass of slithering veins and wriggly bits. We're also provided with far more information on Birkin in particular since, aside from the snippets of his backstory offered throughout the game, we also have a human connection in the form of Annette Birkin, his wife. The persistent reminder that this was once a man forced into a horrible and manipulative situation is one that compels the player to feel compassion for this miserable being, to want to put him out of his misery. Where Evelyn was just a grumpy little girly bioweapon with no redeemable qualities, William Birkin is a man pushed to the brink of a foolish decision, who chose to sacrifice his own humanity rather than allow his creation to fall into the wrong hands. We can respect the man he was, even if we dislike the creature that he becomes. And as for Mr X, the game's next step in Tyrant Evolution after Wesker's cheerful funhouse in Resi 1, there's little I can say that has not already been said. X is extraordinarily effective no matter where you are in the police station. Set up to stalk you for a good chunk of the game, you suffer the ever-loudening thump of his footsteps long before you're made to deal with him again. And just when you think he's gone for good, the big-footed bastard barrels towards you out of the blue. A pure, unthinking and unfeeling killing machine, Mr X's singular goal and resolute focus is bewitching to behold, and though you might think it would get frustrating having to persistently dodge him whilst trying to complete puzzles or reach new areas, this is where the game's encouragement comes in rather handy. As discussed way back at the beginning of the video and a little later besides, the game is designed to etch its map into your mind and the more you learn, the more you engage with your environment, the easier you will find it to escape Mr X. Even if it is only a brief reprieve, you'll soon become accustomed to dodging in and out of rooms, finding new routes, ducking and weaving in and out of sight, even as those thunderous footsteps stampede back and forth just a few feet away. Basically, without wishing to repeat what other people have already said 30,000 times, Mr X is pretty damned effective and coupled with the game's fantastic environment, he makes for one of the most interesting and devious villains in the franchise's history. For now though, 
We're going to conclude with a quick reminder of just how far Capcom have come these past few years. Not too long ago, this was the quality of the Resident Evil series. Devil May Cry as a franchise was outsourced to a Western studio. Umbrella Core saw one of the fastest drops in pricing I have ever seen for a new release. And then something changed. Almost with a snap of fingers, Capcom decided to hell with it. They knuckled down, booked up their ideas, and produced Resident Evil 7. And with the flame ignited, they would go on to become the beloved company of resident crying beautiful devils that we all know and love. In the second part of this series, I'm going to be focusing exclusively on Resident Evil 2's story, but that's a little further in the future, and I want to make videos on Devil May Cry 5 and Sekiro first of all. For now though, thank you for watching, and don't forget, Lickers are blind and Mr. X is slow, but you sure as shit don't want to be in a corridor with both of them. With the high sales, but conversely dismal fan reaction to Resident Evil 6, Capcom made the co <laughs> Who's texting me? How dare you. Fuck off. Where was I?